Um, good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Gunter, for your kind introduction. My thanks to the Buffett Center and especially to you for hosting me today. I spent a wonderful uh, day at the center today. I, I was so scared that there would be a hitch with flying out of Washington, so I came at the crack of dawn. <laughs> And I think they had to open up the center because I was standing behind the door. So um, uh, it's uh, wonderful uh, to be here. And in the audience, I also see um, uh, some friends I had met in Washington several uh, years ago. And they were very kind to come from Chicago to hear, to, to hear me. Um, my uh, prison, my home, is an, basically an account of uh, my lengthy interrogation, arrest, uh, and incarceration in Iran in the hands of Iran's intelligence ministry. But it's also uh, something uh, more. Uh, I give an account in the book of an Iranian childhood of uh, growing up in the gentler and uh, simpler Iran of the 1940s and 50s. Uh, I touch on my uh, working career. I was part of a new generation of professional women uh, pursuing careers and pressing for more equal rights and our place in the society. Just to give you a flavor of what was uh, life like for professional women. When I started at the age of um, 24, working as a journalist for the largest morning paper in Tehran, I was the first woman, uh, not only on the foreign news desk, but in the uh, whole newspaper. And uh, when I asked where uh, the ladies' room is, everybody looked at me very surprised. There was no such thing, you know. I mean, this was a men's word. And so there I was, the intruder. And what am I uh, talking about? But then it took uh, almost two years for them to decide to hire more women. And then they decided to have uh, facilities for women too. And I remember a colleague of mine asking another colleague, um, does this weakling know anything? You know, so this was the approach when I started working as a woman and as a journalist. Today, if you um, uh, go around every state in Iran, every city in Iran, there are more women journalists than men journalists. Just to give you an example, there are more women entering the university, uh, the universities as men. The sheer number of women entering these, the universities frightened so much uh, the men that parliament even toyed with the idea of um, passing a quota in favor of men so they could take in more male students as women. But uh, luckily, they didn't do that. And um, so in the book, I discuss all these things. And I also write about the Iranian Islamic Revolution and also about the current clash between reform and reaction inside Iran's ruling class, the expanding authority of Iran's security services and the troubled relationship uh, between Iran and the United States, because um, these form the background and provide part of the reason um, as to why I, on a simple visit uh, to, my, to see my 93-year-old mother who was living in uh, Tehran, ended up in solitary confinement, accusing of trying to foment a velvet revolution. Um, in December of 2006, I had gone to Iran to spend uh, Christmas with my uh, mother. 
And there was nothing unusual about my trip to Iran. I'd been going back to visit Iran uh, for the previous uh, 14 years. And uh, in December 2006, I spent an uneventful week in Tehran. And uh, I usually saw friends and family on these uh, uh, trips and look, uh, try to look into my mother's affairs. Um, I said goodbye to my mother on December 30th, 2006, <clears throat> and headed to the airport. It was around uh, 1.30 in the morning, and I remember the sky was uh, dark, and it was cloudy, and the ground was still, there was still snow on the ground. And as we drove to the airport, I saw a car uh, driving alongside us. When we slowed down, the car slowed down. When we speeded, the car speeded. And suddenly, he, the car turned in front of our car, and the driver had to just brake. And I just was taken aback, what's going on? And I thought I was a victim of a robbery. Tehran is a metropolis. 14 million inhabitants, such things happen on the way to the airport. So um, uh, three knife-wielding men jumped out of the car. One came and sat uh, next to me and started going through my uh, purse. And for a brief moment, this absurd thought occurred to me that this is the Islamic Republic where uh, strange men and women are not supposed to sit next to each other, not to talk to each other, and the guy is going through my pockets and through my purse. But all this maybe took one minute, and he was out, and all I could uh, say is, please take everything, just leave my passport and my ticket, because I'm, I'm on my way to the airport, I'm leaving the country. And all I remember is a grin on his face. Um, the next day, I started uh, going to, to see whether I can get an Iranian passport to leave the country. Um, I'm a dual citizen, so I had uh, an American passport and an Iranian passport with me. My driver said, you know, um, probably they did that because they assumed you have an American passport, and this is a very valuable commodity in Iran. So the first thing I did when I got home, after being thankful that I'm in one piece, I was not kidnapped, killed, uh, beaten up, whatever, by these so-called robbers, robbers, I called my husband and said, uh, cancel my uh, American passport, because this is what happened. But within 24 hours, I found out that this was not um, a simple robbery. There was much more behind this uh, affair. Um, I was uh, summoned uh, to, the to the intelligence ministry to uh, make, give some explanation as, as part of the process of uh, applying for a passport. So when I went to the intelligence ministry and uh, a man walked in, he was mid in his 30s, and uh, he introduced himself as a Mr. Jafari, and he became my unwelcomed, unwanted companion for the next eight months. He was carrying a laptop on his uh, shoulder, and uh, so said, okay, I need to interrogate you. And he First, as he put in, was asking me questions, he started typing. And I said, look, you're typing so slow. I'm much faster in typing Farsi. So why don't I type the answers? And he didn't like this at all. And he said, just answer my questions. The kind of questions he put to me were not your usual questions that people put to someone who has lost the passport. He. Um, asked me to, of course, tell him the story, what had happened. And then he started saying, um, my husband is Jewish. So he said, um, why are you married to a Jew? You know, that rang a bell. You know, that woke me up, really. Um, I said, excuse me? And he said, yes, 
why are you married to a Jew? And I said, look, this, I'm not going to answer any questions about my private life. I've lost the passport, and I think all one needs is my name, my date of birth, and uh, you know where the passport was issued, and so on. But he said, you are here to answer my questions, or questions. So, um, and he continued, you know. And very soon I found out that, um, that this was really the work of the intelligence ministry, because the kind of questions that he was putting to me were, uh, had a, an intimidating and also a threatening undertone. So uh, he started asking me about the nature of my work at the Woodrow Wilson Center. Um, the Wilson Center is a kind of institute uh, for advanced studies. It's a nonpartisan institution uh, in Washington. Uh, we are not supposed by our uh, laws, by our bylaws, by our constitution to make any policy recommendations. So we try to be really a very neutral forum. Um, and he started asking uh, questions about my, my work. And his approach to me was, well, why would the Wilson Center hire an Iranian-American woman um, to run their Middle East program? And uh, why this focus on the uh, Middle East? So I had to explain to him that the Middle East program is not the only program at the Wilson Center. There are many more programs, and uh, there is the Russian uh, program, there is the um, Africa program, and I went down the line for them. And I kept on telling them, I'm sure that even under the Soviet Union, uh, when my colleague who ran the then Kennan Institute for Soviet Studies would go visit Russia, uh, the Soviet Union, nobody would tell him that why uh, he ran the Kennan Institute at the Wilson Center. But he was, uh, he was very threatening and would always remind me of just answering his uh, points. So very soon I found out that the, the matter of their concern was something entirely different. Um, the intelligence ministry had, and the office of the president, I found out, had um, convinced themselves that the United States was bogged down in Iraq and in Afghanistan and uh, uh, was not going to uh, uh, attack Iran militarily. But for 30 years, it had tried to undermine the regime and to promote regime change in Iran. Uh, my arrest happened under the previous administration, and uh, there was a lot of loose talk in Washington of uh, regime change, the access of evil um, and rogue states. And there really was a sense of paranoia and fear that uh, the United States will use uh, foundations, research centers, even universities to um, try and undermine the regime. And the way they sort of envisaged all this was that um, they would, the United the government, the United States government would instruct research centers, think tanks, universities to invite scholars from Iran, to invite civil society activists from Iran, to invite women uh, leaders uh, from Iran to come to the United States and then uh, recruit them as agents for the CIA. And so my interrogator would produce a pile of document in front of me and would say, well, tell us who were the CIA agent who came to such and such a meeting at the Middle East program at the Wilson Center. And I would say, look, I mean, I've been with you now for four weeks, and I don't know what your real name is. 
Do you think that if there are people from the CIA who come to our meetings, we are a public uh, institution, so we don't know people's name at all. So if they come, do you think they will come up to me and say, hello, I work for the CIA, this is what I do, uh, I'm here to recruit your speaker from Iran? Um, but, you know, my interrogation outside prison lasted almost four months. And I would go every morning around uh, 8.30 to the intelligence ministry um, and return sometimes after eight hours, nine hours. So um, I refused to eat any food when I was being interrogated because I was not sure that whether they would drug me or not, and I wanted to remain uh, very focused on the uh, questioning. Um, the line of questioning stayed exactly the same uh, thing. You know, tell us about the nature of your work. Tell us about every single meeting you had. Tell us about why you have a Middle East program at the Wilson Center. And finally, uh, tell us what the plans of the United States government uh, is uh, regarding uh, overthrowing the regime. And then they would explain to me that they have a room full of uh, files on uh, not only me, but on other uh, dual uh, nationals. And uh, they, would, uh, they are not going to show that to me in the intelligence ministry. But if necessary, they will take me to a place where I don't have then any recourse to the outside world. Um, I never, <clears throat> my gut feeling would always tell me that my situation will get worse. But then I was constantly assured by friends uh, abroad, I mean, in the United States and also in Iran that uh, they will not take me to a Vin prison because that would have been the next step. Lo and behold, on May 8, uh, uh, when I had gone for my interrogation, yet again, another day uh, of interrogation to the intelligence ministry, uh, the famous Mr. Jafari walked into the room this time without his laptop, took out a pile of papers from his uh, pocket and produced a piece of paper, which I never read, and said, this is your arrest warrant, and we are taking you to prison, to Evin. Um, I think the roof came just tumbling down on my head because I was familiar with Evin prison. People had disappeared there. People had been tortured there uh, three years earlier. A, an Iranian Canadian woman journalist was beaten to death under interrogation. So all that was just coming back to my mind. I said, can I make a phone call? And he said, yes, but you have to be very brief. So I called my 93 year old mother and said, they're taking me to a VIN. Get in touch, please, with my family. I need a lawyer. Um, I had arranged with my husband that if they take me to a VIN, uh, he should get in touch with Shirin Abadi, the Nobel uh, Peace Prize winner who I heard had spoken here uh, a couple of years ago, um, and ask her to represent me. He got in touch with her. She was in Europe. He said, sure, I will be more than happy to be Holly's lawyer, but let me tell you that they won't see me. They won't let me see her. They won't let me see her file and uh, I won't be able to do anything for her in Iran except make a lot of noise abroad. And lo and behold, she was right. For the 105 days I was in Evin prison, I was completely cut off from the uh, rest of the world, from the outside world. I had only one visit from my mother, and I never saw Shirin, nor did she see my file. Um, I was taken to Evin prison. The process of getting booked into prison is relatively uh, fast and very efficient. Uh, you walk in and they make you stand and face the wall and all you see is a number of other men and women standing alongside you facing the wall. Uh, within five minutes, uh, a woman guard showed up and blindfolded me and uh, 
took me with her. Uh, being blindfolded is a very uh, humiliating uh, experience. You know, you don't know where you are going. You don't know where who is taking you where. Um, it is debilitating and you feel like a child completely lost. You don't know whether you are going to hit your head uh, at the stairway or what. So she would, uh, she said, hang on to my hand. So I walked up the stairs with her and then at some stage she said, remove your blindfold. I did remove it and we were standing in a corridor which was the uh, women ward of political prisoner. It's known as uh, ward 209. Uh, so she opened uh, a door and she said, uh, go in, remove your blindfold, this is your cell. So I walked in, I looked around the room and there was a dilapidated but clean uh, brown carpet on the floor, a broken metal sink on the wall, uh, one blanket and a copy of the Quran. And, uh, she slammed the door, and when I heard the door slamming, I, it boomeranged in my head. I mean, to this day, when I hear doors banging, it brings back the memory of that uh, moment. Um, my interrogation started that same afternoon. Um, this time, my interrogator, Mr. Jafari, uh, was joined with his, uh, by his superior. So there were two of them now interrogating me. But when his superior was there, I had to sit and face the wall. Um, and I told him that this is the first time ever that I'm talking to someone without seeing that person or looking into his face. And uh, he used the Persian expression and he said, to my shame, this has to be, they say, for those of you who know Farsi, he said, Sharmande. So, mm, and the process of being interrogated started, but in prison the interrogation was much harsher. Uh, in, it was more intimidating, it was frightening, um, because it, they threatened me immediately with um, putting me, keeping me as long as it is necessary for me to put in the missing pieces of this famous puzzle that the United States had put together to overthrow the Iranian uh, regime. And um, I kept on telling them that I, I'm, I don't know what they are talking about, but that was beside the point. They had convinced themselves that they were not able to break me outside prison, but inside prison they were going to do to me what they did not do outside prison. Um, they um, started the... Uh, then they took me in front of a magistrate to then, who uh, wrote a war, official warrant of my arrest saying that they're going to keep me in solitary confinement um, because um, I'm endangering the national security of Iran. And I looked at the person and I said, you must be joking. I'm 67 years old. I weigh barely 105 pounds and I'm not even five foot tall and I'm endangering the national security of the most powerful nation in the Persian Gulf. But there was no humor there. So they said, that's it. And uh, we are going to keep you here because we don't want you to escape the country. I said, but I had four months time to escape. You know, I mean, I was free. If I wanted to leave the country, I would have done it. And I absolutely did not want to do so because I felt that I'd come legally into Iran and I was going to leave the country also legally. Um, in prison, they, uh, they produced their famous documents, which basically was the documents they had taken from the, uh, pre from the security uh, files of the uh, Shah's regime. So, and just, uh, they were also funny incidents. For example, they questioned me a whole morning about a man. So he kept on saying, how do you know Mr. So-and-so? And went on back and forth. He used to, they kept on telling me, he worked at the Israeli embassy in, in uh, uh, Iran before the revolution. And I kept on saying, I've never heard of this person. Even the name doesn't ring a bell. 
when I came back to the United States, I asked my husband whether there was such a person at the Israeli embassy, whether he recalls ever seeing him. He said, sure, there was a woman there called that, but you never met her because she was there even before uh, you, know, you returned to Iran. So I wasn't even there, but they, were, they had piled up every possible information trying to uh, incriminate me. Um, they, uh, again, they expressed their concern about um, the foundations. They believe that the Soros Foundation, uh, which, is, uh, which gave, gives grant to the Wilson Center and to a number of other research centers, uh, their aim would be to uh, promote a velvet revolution in Iran, exactly what had happened in the Ukraine and also in uh, Georgia. The Orange Revolution, the Rose Revolution, they had studied it very carefully and knew to the last letter what had happened in these countries. And um, just to sort of uh, uh, take you, sort of jump two years uh, front of us, I, um, in the green revolution of the green uh, movement of the, the current green movement of post-revolution Iran must have frightened the intelligence ministry people so much because it reminded them of the Rose Revolution and the uh, uh, Orange Revolution in the Ukraine. And I think this was one of the reasons they went so viciously after the uh, protesters, after the presidential elections in Iran. They really had this sense of paranoia that if there is any assembly or if there is any gathering by civil society activists, by students, by workers, this definitely will get out of control and they won't be able to control it. That's why every time the women's uh, the movement announced a gathering on the occasion of the um, International Women's Day, the security police would show up even before the women showed up in the park and would make their, uh, their arrest and uh, would clamp down on them. So uh, I got a sense that uh, they really um, are trying their best to try and kill every kind of civil society activity. And this was already under President Ahmadinejad, where you felt that the uh, security people was, uh, were gaining uh, more in uh, power. And even a person like myself who would go to Iran he was very careful, did not meet with uh, uh, people I used to, did not meet with journalists, did not meet with university professors, because there was this sense of ill at ease that something was in the air. Um, on the other hand, you know, under President Ahmadinejad, the press had been uh, curbed, a, num a great number of newspapers were closed, and um, the people who came from the civil society groups to our meetings were very hesitant to speak in uh, public. Um, the Congress had allocated $75 million to promote democracy inside Iran. So that was even more problematic for the civil society people. So the first thing they would say when they would come to our meetings was that, um, uh, we don't want to have anything to do with this money. We don't, I mean, we don't want to apply. And uh, we just, we feel that our civil society movement is indigenous and we can manage. And the more there is an interference from abroad, the more it makes life difficult uh, for us. Uh, I was kept 105 days at Evin, and when I was not interrogated, being a very disciplined person, I decided to have a very strict regimen for myself. So I, would, I didn't have a watch. And uh, for three months, uh, I would just uh, sort of wake up uh, with the chirping of the birds in Evin's uh, uh, yard. They had these old trees because it's in a village. And I knew that it was five in the morning. Um, 
sometimes I would wake up thinking I'm in my home in Potomac because in the morning the birds sing in Potomac too. Um, and then uh, the summers are very long in, in Tehran, so would be up till eight or nine o'clock. And I think the third time I saw the moon, I knew that I've been in prison now for three uh, uh, times because there were two windows high in this near the ceiling and the windows were barred but you could see a little bit of the sky um, and of course there were there were two fluorescent lights that were on 24 hours a day in my cell so it was very difficult unless it became very dark it was very difficult to know what time of the night or day um, it was. But still, I would insist uh, that a woman guard would wake, would call me at 6 o'clock. I would get up and I would um, shower and then exercise and uh, pace up and down my uh, cell. I would be up on my feet eight to nine hours a day. I had two bottles of water twice the size of this. I would use them as weights. So I would do weights, I would do Pilates um, for hours and hours. And then um, the women uh, guard would always come and tell me, why don't you sit? Can't you sit still? You know, we have other prisoners who sit and don't move so much. And at the end, I noticed that they were very worried because if I was sitting in a corner, they could check on me once every two hours, but because I was moving so much, so when they would come and look through the people, if they didn't see me, so they would get very worried so because I was pacing, I was on the floor doing uh, my exercise. Um, I was, um, I had, um, had access to fresh air uh, one hour a day, sometimes two hours a day. Uh, we would negotiate. Everything was negotiable there. So I would say, if nobody else wants to use the terrace, why can't I stay a bit longer? And nobody in their sane mind goes and stays in August at 2 o'clock in the afternoon outside, you know, when it's 110 degree and the weather is dry in there. But I, would, I was craving for fresh air, so I would go there. Um, I was told that they were going to put me on trial. So, and um, that was my fear. I knew that if they put me on trial, it's going to be a short trial, like we just saw in uh, uh, taking place in Iran a couple of weeks ago. And I knew that they would not allow a lawyer. And I knew also that I had to speak in my defense. And if I was not able to convince them for uh, seven months, they probably, I could not convince their own, their judge, who is probably a member of the intelligence ministry um, uh, too. Um, I didn't have access to books for quite a while until there was another Iranian American who was picked up when I was picked up, a sociologist called Kian uh, Tajbash. He lived in Iran, so he had access to his books. So, uh, one day when my interrogators walked in with 10 books, I said, oh, are these for me? And he said, no, these belong to uh, Kian. And I said, um, could you ask him whether I can borrow one book? And he said, take it. I said, what? He said, yeah, take it. He can't wait. I said, oh, no. I know. I mean, these are his books. I, so he shrugged his shoulder. He took the books for Kian Taj Bach and around... 10 o'clock that evening, the woman guard came and said, I have books for you. So he brought three books. And that was the beginning of an, ex not exchange, of a one-way sort of tr book trafficking. He would send me uh, books, and then I would read them and returning. Um, the last book I read in prison was uh, Our Man in Havana. Um, I, uh, you know, I would read anything, anything that would come my way. But what you would be amused to know was that um, at some stage I said, look, I'm dying without books. Can I, I have access to the library in prison? Because I knew that Evin had the library. They said, yes, um, your woman guard can go and get the books for you. So she would go and bring piles of book on Shiism for me. So I decided, okay, I'm going to educate myself. 
So I read the Quran twice cover to cover. I read every single book on Shiism she brought for me. And then finally I said, Is, aren't there any novels in this prison? She walked in with a number of books by Nikos Kazantzakis. And I thought, this is very odd. A leftist Greek writer in the prison of the Islamic Republic. Somebody must have liked Nikos Kazantzakis. And the prisoner probably never, I mean, the guards or the people who run the prison never bothered to read that. And of course, there was a translation of Nostradamus too. So, <laughs> so these were books of the Evin uh, um, library. Um, my uh, release came as uh, sudden as my arrest. Um, one afternoon when I was busy pacing up and down, and by then I had lost 20 pounds in prison because I was weighing 85 pounds and I had decided that um, another two weeks and I'm going to go on a hunger strike. And because after the uh, original warrant was for a um, temporary detention of four months. But once the four months are over, then they have to put you on trial and then they have to, they will move you to the regular prison. So I've decided, okay, I'm going to go give myself two more weeks to go on hunger strike. Um, two weeks before my release, um, they suddenly brought a TV for me and I, they said, you can have access to newspaper and to uh, TV. Uh, but by then my eyes were suffering so much because they had refused to give me my eye drop. So, and the lights were on 24 hours a day, so I just couldn't watch the TV. But I said, okay, I'll turn it on and I just listened to it because my only contact uh, with the outside, I mean, with the, uh, with the outside myself was with my interrogators and with the women guards. And the women guards were told that, you know, there is such an, so much exchange you can have with the prisoners and not uh, uh, more. So having that, uh, the, the TV was very interesting um, because um, I was hoping that maybe I can find out what is going on about me. Uh, because I didn't know. Of course, my bad luck was that uh, during that period where the TV was in my room, they did not bother to mention neither me nor uh, Kian. But one afternoon during my interrogation, uh, the interrogator asked, I said, how do you know Obama? And I said, who? And uh, this is the Persian pronunciation of Obama, Obama. And I said, you mean, I, got, I started thinking, and this was at the end of a day where there has been a lot of interrogation about who do you know in this town, who do you know in the States, etc., etc. And I said, you mean the senator from Illinois? And they said, yes. I said, how do I know him? They said, yes, how do you know him? I started thinking, and I said, oh, yes. He spoke at the Council on Foreign Relations in Washington, and I went to his talk. And I was going to say he and Senator Luger, and I stopped myself because I thought I'd mention Senator Luger, and then they say, who is he? A new Pandora box, an additional five days of explanation. So I said, um, um, you know, they said, he said, no, tell us about the meetings you had with him. I said, I never met Senator Obama. Why? And I had made a point of never asking them a question because um, uh, I didn't want to get into a conversation uh, with them. Well, they said, well, he talked about you. And I said, he talked about me? And they said, yes, he, uh, he talked about uh, you. And I said, um, what did he say? They said, well, he asked for your freedom. And I said, he asked for my freedom? And they said, yes. I said, who, did anybody else talk about me? You know? And they said, yes, Senator Clinton, but we can understand her. She's a woman, you are a woman. She's a feminist, you are a feminist. She's a Democrat, you are a Democrat. I said, but 
he, Senator Obama, is a Democrat too. But we left it at that, you know. <laughs> but that was very important for me because I thought if Senator Obama and Senator Clinton talked about me, so something is going on in the outside world. Anyway, on um, August uh, uh, 22nd, I think, I was told I can uh, leave uh, prison. So um, I didn't believe them because in the past they had made a number of very cruel jokes with me, telling me I can leave prison and I was not able to leave uh, prison. So I, I, mm, I said, okay, um, I need to call home to tell them that they should expect me. They said, by the way, you can leave prison, but we will not allow you to go back to the United States. You can go back to your mother's house. I found out that uh, Mr. Hamilton, the president of the Wilson Center, after having written to Ahmadinejad, not getting an answer, after having written to the Speaker of Parliament, not receiving an answer, had written to the uh, Supreme Leader. And the Supreme Leader had uh, written back to him. And this was the first time he was told that uh, the Supreme Leader was communicating with a high official, high American official, and he was told that um, the matter of your concern would be resolved soon. But that, it took three weeks between the correspondence and the day I was uh, released. Um, when I went home, uh, Kian Tajbash was still kept in jail, and uh, uh, he was released months after I was released. I, left in, uh, on September 2nd, I left Iran uh, because I was told I can go and pick up my passport and go. Um, I remember that moment when I sat on the plane and the hostess closed the door. This time I knew that this is not going to boomerang in my head because this, the clang of that door meant that I was free uh, to go home. But um, Kian Tajbach lived in Iran, so he stayed there. And uh, a month ago, uh, he was picked up again uh, after the presidential elections. And this time, he was put on a trial, and he was uh, given a 12-year sentence. Um, which is shocking because he's apolitical, he's a sociologist. After our experience in Evin, he kept a very low profile and uh, uh, they look, I believe the intelligence ministry looked around and decided he would make a good example of, of uh, uh, someone who was part of the previous you know, plot of undermining uh, the regime. There are also others in prison now, so, uh, but let me finish by saying that international pressure helps a lot to get prisoners out of uh, Iran. You have three American hikers who are currently in solitary confinement in uh, Evin prison. And as I said, you have Kion and there are the um, leadership of the reformist movement, a lot of uh, protesters are all in prison and uh, I don't think we should forget about them. We should always speak about them. In my case, international pressure helped and I'm sure in their case it will help too. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, how is Happy to take questions from you if people have questions for her. I'm sure you will. I'm even wired so I can walk and answer the question. How did you keep yourself mentally stimulated while in solitary confinement? I wrote two books in my head. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason why I say I wrote the books in my head was that I knew that every word I put on paper, the moment I go for interrogation or I go out for my one hour uh, fresh air, access to fresh air, 
they would come and, uh, you know, take all the papers and take it to the interrogators, and then I had to explain. So I wrote a children's story for my two grandchildren based on all the Iranian fairy tales I had been told as a child and read as a child. And I also uh, wrote a biography of my paternal grandmother who had a lot of influence on me, and I talk about her uh, in the in the book, but um, and I also decided that I'm not going to think about my family at all. I refuse to think about of my fa about my family because I knew that I would break down. So I come for 105 days. They just did not exist for me. Yes, please. Uh, um, did you? Um, uh uh, consider yourself a victim of um, harsh policy or harsh rhetoric by the Bush administration at the time um, because of the way they were threatening Iran. And um, do you think you were damaged because of that and also the other NGOs who were damaged by the way uh, Bush administration was threatening Iran? People who were trying to do good, but because they thought they're part of this overthrow on that $75 million. And my second question was that you also um, made a videotape mm -hmm. of supposed yeah. confession. Yeah. And uh, what was that all about, if you okay. could elaborate on sure. that? Sure. Um, I think I was the victim, really, of the animosity and the enmity that existed between the two countries for 30 years, you know. The lack of understanding, the lack of engagement, the lack of exchange, you know, because the, even under President Khatami, towards the end, the intelligence ministry was watching quite, uh, you know, very carefully uh, what was going on in these think tanks and research centers. But of course, the allocation of, by Congress, of the 75 million dollars, you know, added uh, a lot of, created a lot of concern and suspicion among, uh, among the intelligence ministry uh, people. But I, before me, they had targeted another uh, Iranian Canadian, a professor of philosophy who lived in Iran, but who had very uh, close uh, interaction with think tanks in Europe and in Iran, so they had picked him up first, and I was number two on the line, and then Kian Tajbash was number three. Sure, I mean that's why I think engagement is very important because, and and also you know we didn't have any relations. So the Swiss represent the United States in Iran. You know, I didn't have any visit by by them. You know, I didn't have any. I didn't have any visit by the Red Cross. So if you don't talk to each other, you don't even have access to these normal thing, international thing. The confession, um, very. I think it was within the first month. They came to me and they said, uh, "Would you appear on camera?" And I said, "Sure. I don't have any problem because my work is transparent and whatever I've been telling you." for uh, four months outside prison and now one month inside prison, I'll be more than happy to say it on, on, on uh, camera. Knowing that they were going to edit it, cut it, splice it, I knew that because you know I'm a student of Iran. I had watched these confessions, so-called confessions, before the revolution, after the revolution, so I knew what they were going to do with it. Um, but um, I said, yes, I'll do it. And the, they took me in a room which looked like more a living room type of a place, you know, in a vin, uh, and they had, I don't know, plants, and they had a bottle of water. And the funniest thing was that I, who was blindfolded all the time and sat facing the wall, there I would sit facing at least 20 men in that room, you know. And my interrogator would constantly do this, meaning push back your scarf, you know, so saying that show some of your hair. Usually they do the opposite, you know. So if you look in the book or at my pictures, then there is so much hair I show, you know. And uh, 
it was a very bad moment for me. I think it was the lowest moment of uh, my stay in prison because uh, I, th I was very careful in not implicating anybody, not talking, implicating the Wilson Center. The pressure on me all along was to implicate the Wilson Center and say the Wilson Center is the main instrument of overthrowing the regime in Iran. So I, I refused to do that. And even in that uh, video, I did not. Uh, but the feeling I got, you know, is that um, you feel dirty, you feel soiled, you feel miserable, you feel low. So I remember uh, uh, when I, and it lasted an hour, when I came back to, my, to the world, I said uh, to the women guard, I need to take a shower. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought I can wash this up. I refused to see that until uh, almost two months after I uh, returned. And then I saw what a miserable job they did. I mean, it wasn't even a professional job once I watched. It wasn't only me, but it was also Kian Taj Bakhsh and uh, the other Iranian philosopher also, and it was called in the name of democracy, and I was told that they had advertised it on uh, TV. And in those 10 days I was out of prison, um, every time I went on the street, people would recognize me. They would come up to me and would say, well, we are so proud of you, or there's nothing wrong with that velvet revolution. You know, it's not uh, violent. You know, so I think both last time, what they did with us, and also again this time with putting the leadership of the reformist movement on trial and showing it on TV, they got exactly the opposite uh, effect. And so that was, uh, yes, please. Hi, um, thank you so much for your talk. I wondered if you could talk about how your experience that you just recounted in prison mm -hmm. changes your work or how you understand your work your mission and what you seek to accomplish at the Wilson Center, mm -hmm. if at all? Um, I've always been for engagement. Before I went to prison and even after I came out of prison. So therefore, uh, nothing, has, nah, nothing has changed. I came, I came, I arrived in Washington on a Thursday afternoon I went on Friday to the Wilson Center to see my colleagues, to see Lee Hamilton. He said, um, you should uh, take, take as much time as you want to rest. And I said, no, I, I'll be back at work Monday morning because I have to prove to myself that they did not break me, they did not break my spirit, and uh, so that, but, what, what changed in me is that I no longer take um, freedom and the rule of law for granted, you know. And I think when you go through that experience that I went in a country where the rule of law is dependent on the whim of people, when you don't have any recourse to legal, you know, help, when there is no freedom, freedom of opinion, freedom of press, and so on, you learn to value, you learn to cherish these values. So that has changed in me, you know, not just the change. And you mentioned that you're apolitical, but I would love to hear just what you think about sort of the Obama administration and also, um, you know, right now the, um, the anniversary of the takeover of the U.S. Embassy and the protests that are going on in Iran. And if there's, I know you mentioned you're for engagement, but if there's a certain, you know, what you see kind of going forward. Mm -hmm. um, engaging Iran, talking to Iran on, on the nuclear issue does not mean that you should not talk about the violation of human rights and the atrocities that were committed in Iran uh, after the presidential elections in June. You know, these two things can go parallel 
with each other hand in hand. And I think that is what the Obama administration is doing. Look, 30 years of not talking to Iran has led us to nowhere. Iran was sanctioned. It managed to break the sanctions. Iran was isolated. It managed to develop a nuclear program and a missile program under isolation and sanction. So there is no harm in giving it a try and engaging in Iran and seeing where we go. If Iran does not reciprocate to, the, to President Obama's really reaching out to them, then it is their fault, you know. And until President Obama came, became president, the Iranian excuse was always that we are dealing with an administration in the United States that is not interested in talking to us. On the contrary, wants to overthrow the regime. Suddenly you have a president who says, you know, we respect your you know, the, your territorial integrity. We don't have a problem with you, your nuclear program provided it does not become, uh, uh, it stays as it is for peaceful purposes. And that we don't have a pro problem if you continue under strict supervision to enrich your uh, uranium, all these things, you know. So what, what are they going to tell their people? There is, a United, there is a government that is reaching out to them. So, but on the other hand, I think the administration has been very skillful in dealing with the human rights issue. If you look at President Obama's um, announcement yesterday on the occasion of the, anniversary, the 30th anniversary of the hostage taking in Iran, he, he talked about the violation of human rights. He mentioned that, you know, but he also talked about, you know, the Iranian, if they want to be part of the family of nation, they have to live up to their uh, responsibilities. And so therefore the Iranian can no longer demonize the Americans. So we just have to wait and see how the Iranians are going to, uh, to react. But the, the atrocities have left a terrible, bitter um, taste in everybody's mouth inside Iran and outside Iran. And I think the government in Iran has a lot, you know, has, is responsible for what is happening. Even again yesterday, people were beaten up in the streets of Tehran and other Iranian cities. People were picked up, uh, you know, journalists were picked up. The leadership of the women's movement again was picked up. So, I mean, all these things, I mean, they are, they are responsible and people should talk about that aspect. You mentioned um, how important international pressure is. Um, what can, like, as a student or an individual who doesn't have a lot of political influence um, can do uh, to kind of help in that international pressure? Um, should write to your Congress. This is the nice thing about this country. Every two years you can either elect them or throw them out. Mm -hmm. And so therefore your voice matters, even if you are a, you know, even if you are a student, I mean, he needs, he or she needs your voice. Write, write to them, write to them and express your concern. I mean, I, I had a, an email today from an 11-year-old girl, really, who had been to uh, a presentation I gave uh, two days ago in Fort Worth at the university. I don't know what she was doing there, but she was there. And she wrote to me and she said, you know, I was uh, very much impressed by what you said. Uh, uh, a couple of questions and then she had to go, and then what can I do? And I, I didn't get a chance to write back to her, but I'm going to write back to her. I said, yes, just, just you know, ask your mom to write to your congressman. And so, sure you can, because really every voice helps, you know, and they, they need to, um, I think Iran has to be accountable uh, 
uh, for the atrocities that it is uh, committing inside Iran, you know, and they, one can't just let them get away with it this time. Yes. Did your captors tell you which part of the Iranian government exactly they belong to? Because this knife wielding and everything does not sound like Ministry of Information. It's probably intelligence. Passage. Intelligence, uh, intelligence of the Revolutionary Guard, or because also War 209 is usually Revolutionary Guard, where Revolutionary Guard no, people No, uh, I think there is another word which is uh, Revolutionary Guard. I think it's 245 or something like that. 209 is for political prisoners. It's mm -hmm. where Kadivar and Nuri and these people were mm -hmm. held. No, uh, that there was, uh, there is another word for, for the Revolutionary Guard. But um, that's at least what I was, no. All my uh, uh, captors told me was that they are university professors. <laughs> yeah, they told me we are uh, university professors, and uh, uh, but I wasn't able uh, to find out whether they are university professors in their spare time or they are interrogators in their spare time. <laughs> that I wasn't sure really, and. They also were very much interested in discussing theories of revolution, in discussing Foucault, Fukuyama, but I refused to do that with them. I, I really kept my answers to sort of bare minimum, and they loved to lecture. So I let them talk. It was better for me if they would talk, I mean, you know, that I would talk. But um, no, no, it was, you know, they were wearing that green outfit and they were part of the intelligence ministry people. Uh, later on, uh, I was told that this was planned, you know, step by step. They were not part of the revolution regard because um, that's what I was told. No, no. Yes. <laughs> you have an expert sitting here <laughs> on Iran. You know. um, I think Iranian women have been the only group who have been standing up to the Islamic Republic since its inception. You know, they have fought uh, every step of the way uh, to try and restore some of their uh, their lost uh, rights. So putting it in a nutshell. Three years ago, a group of women and men got together and they started um, the campaign to collect a million signatures to uh, promote equal right um, under the law. To, um, and their plan was to collect these uh, signatures then present it to uh, parliament. Um, the leadership of the movement has been uh, arrested and sent to jail. When I was in prison, they would uh, be in prison, brought to prison. They would stay one week, two weeks, and then released on bail and then brought back. I never met them, but I later on found out uh, they were there. They were pushing very hard, you know, for, for uh, major changes in uh, women's rights. They have succeeded. The age of marriage, for example, was raised from 9 to 13. Uh, it was reduced to 9 after uh, the revolution. It's now uh, 13. Uh, women, uh, under certain conditions, can have uh, get their child custody, have access to child custody. Um, there are now family, there are family courts which look into uh, family disputes, but usually uh, the judge uh, sides with the men. But, but there are um, uh, women, there are uh, more uh, women in the, as I said earlier, in the uh, entrance class of universities uh, than men. Um, Women are much bolder, uh, I would say, when it comes to the protest movement. For the first time after the uh, presidential election in Iran and the protest movement, we saw young men and women walking uh, side by side, demonstrating side by side, even appearing together at the Friday prayer, which was really a first. Um, 
the wife of one of the candidates, Zahra Rahnavard, signed in public the campaign. Each of the uh, candidates in the presidential elections, the former Speaker of Parliament, the former, uh, a former Prime Minister, a former Commander of the Revolution Regard, had an advisor on women's affairs. Uh, Mr. Karubi, a cleric, the former Speaker of Parliament, said that if he becomes president, he will appoint a woman as Iran's foreign minister to negotiate with Hillary Clinton. So, you know, I mean, women have really been the most uh, remarkable uh, force in, uh, in the Islamic Republic. And um, they are not scared. You can't frighten them. They are very outspoken. And the interesting thing is that um, there are the conservative women, the women who come from more traditional families, have the same ambitions as the uh, women from the middle classes because they want to act, they want to have access to education. They want their husband. They don't want their husband to have the right to marry as many wives as four wives as he uh, wants. They want the child custody. They want the right to be able to work to study. So, and I think that's why uh, Ahmadinejad this time uh, nominated three women to his cabinet. Two were rejected by parliament, but one, a very conservative woman, was approved. So for the first time in 30 years, you have a woman minister, a minister of health is a woman. And I believe that he was trying to get, to sort of gain back the women he lost in the, uh, uh, post-election periods in Iran. Uh, more of a historical, longer-term question, maybe a bit larger. Uh, <clears throat> I was a student here in the United States many years ago and the Shah was still in power. And then the Shah, my Iranian friends, went back to Iran to make a communist society. That was their idea. To so make a communist society? Uh, mm. was, was mm. there. My friends and, well, okay. who knows what happened to them. Khomeini took over. But if you look at Iran, I'm now talking like 74, 75 to now, it's nothing but a regime, overthrow, uh, form of a dictatorship, whatever what name you want to put on it. And here you are like two generations at least that have these kind of a societal, cultural, uh, historical perspective. How do you see Iran, say, 30, 40 years from now? Can, um, can society from within transform to mm -hmm. A form of democracy, as we're mm -hmm. used to here, and is that the ideal form? Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> first of all, I think while you had a number of coups in other Middle Eastern countries, you know, like uh, Iraq, Syria, um, in Iran you never had a coup. You had a very stable regime, mm -hmm. which was the Pahlavi dynasty, and then was overthrown, and you had the Islamic Republic, and I think... Uh, in the Islamic Republic, the transfer of power has been uh, not violent at all. I mean, Ayatollah uh, Khomeini, Khomeini died, his successor Khomeini became uh, the supreme leader and he has been around. Um, in the early days of the revolution, there were a couple of assassination attempts, but uh, since then, I mean, every president has served his term, uh, two, his two terms. And then, uh, you know, the transfer of power has been not at all violent. What happened this time was very unusual. I mean, uh, had the elections not been manipulated and whoever the winner was, um, even if uh, either Mr. Musavi or even if they were really counting the vote and Ahmadinejad had won, you wouldn't have seen this protest movement the green uh, movement. I mean, basically the protest movement was because of the manipulation of the elections. Then it turned out to be more, you know, it became death to the dictator precisely because they had rigged the election. It became, um, you know, uh, we want change and all these things. But um, I'm a very optimist person because I think every so many years, you have a movement of the young people coming out into the streets wanting a democratic reform. And uh, we saw a semblance of uh, Iranian version of democracy under President Khatami. 
you know, the press was flourishing, the civil society was gaining uh, momentum, and uh, he tried to rein in the security uh, services, you know. So, so every so many years, uh, there is such a possibility. So I, I just don't give up hope, and I think that eventually the society will open up because the difference between the time when your friends went back to Iran and now is that Iran is a connected society. I mean, people are on the internet, people do use Twitter, people use uh, their cell phone, people send text messages. I mean, uh, yesterday, is every... Country is, no, no, this is across the country. I mean, how mm. did we know what was happening in the cities of Shiraz and Tabriz and Isfahan? Because these young people were sending out videos, text messages, you know, to CNN, to Reuters, to BBC. The country has changed, you know. I mean, it's amazing. The, uh, the government thought that uh, during the protest movement, they will uh, tell all foreign journalists to leave because the argument was that, you know, we are not going to renew your license. They left, but we were, we knew exactly what was happening because you had a million journalists in the streets of Tehran and Iranian city constantly sending out messages. And the, the young people are not scared of anything, really. Not so much.